Coming up on Trillionaire Mindset's Girls Only episode. Ding! It's, uh, the BuzzFeed News shuts down. Jonah Peretti, is he an idiot? We're talking about what the hell's going on with this impending writer's strike. Plus, earnings season is upon us. We got Netflix and Tesla. Did they beat or did they miss? And what does the market think of all of this? Ooh. Plus, we're talking about the Apple savings account that might be able to give you all kinds of funky yield. No, not funky. Fuck, you stupid. No, funky yield. It's uh, going to be a lot of money, baby. Ooh, daddy, give me that yield. What did you say just before we started? I said, remember, this one is for the girls. Yeah, okay? girls last only. week was a boys only episode. Yeah. This is girls only. That if was last week? Wasn't it? I think. Yeah. Last yeah. week was the boys episode. Girls, don't go back and listen. Yeah. And boys. we were talking about boys you're, stuff. Boys, you better turn it off right now, son. Boys. Get out of here, turn son. Turn around. Yeah. Face the wall. Face the wall. Plug your ears. All right. It's not for you. Now that the boys are all gone, hey girls, how's it going? <laughs> how's your week? <laughs> how's your day? You look nice. Fuck. That is a good. It is a good color on you. Me, no, it ben, really is. Ben and I were talking about it, and yeah, you look so baby girl. It's incredible, man. Wow, I didn't know that. Uh, I didn't know that they made them like you. <laughs> It's early, man. All right, ladies, ben check the disclaimer a, in the description box. What? Been trying to hit on a woman at the coffee shop. So you drink so that? I didn't, know they, I didn't know they actually make them like you. That's crazy. <laughs> no, what? <laughs> Checking her tag. No, I'm just trying to see what make a model. <laughs> oh, the tag on her on her blouse? Yeah. What tag? Hey, Emil, do you know what a blouse is? Like some kind of lady shirt? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's a shirt for girls. <laughs> yeah. So Do that's, you like my blouse? Yeah, we did not coordinate this, but no. uh, we do. We did go green for girls. Yeah. We go cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs and green for girls. Yeah. Well, um, so we have a live stream coming on May 4th. That would be next week? Two weeks. That's two weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, two weeks away. Two weeks counted, too. Because today is 420, yesterday for you guys. You're all probably high as hell right now. There was a no, line. they were high yesterday. Yeah, we were high yesterday. We're high no, right they now. Were. They were high yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> Do we wear green because we're high? No. Yeah, because it's weed, though. I just was like, you know what? Putting that shirt on. <laughs> yeah. I was like, ah, I haven't worn the green flannel in a couple weeks. Well, Ben also only has like two shirts. Man, shut up. That's <laughs> not true. I just bought a whole bunch of clothes that I haven't worn yet. Uh, there was a big line outside of a, a local weed store here. Yeah, I didn't realize the... what it was for, and you were like, it's 420. So stupid. Yeah. I would be embarrassed. Why not just have weed already? Yeah, you would think the type... You would think <laughs> that it's the such type a big of... deal to you. Yeah, the type of person who's in line first thing Before in the morning... Before 9 a.m., what kind of stoners are these? <laughs> On the weed holiday. Yeah, but well, those I gotta get, deals. Yeah, I guess. What are you getting? Fucking thirty dollars for an ounce or uh, an eighth? Yeah. Who knows? Jesus Christ, man. Hey, God bless them. You had stony balonies. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not even. I'm not gonna get high today. I haven't gotten high in like uh, I don't know a week, a couple weeks, and then before that it was months. Weed's uh-huh. overrated these days. Give me an edible, I guess. Or a spliff. Ooh, maybe I should smoke a spliff. That's a way to... <laughs> Not today, though, because that would involve buying cigarettes. Yeah, I just winked at him. Well, we got a lot to get to today, folks. Wait, should we talk about what we were doing in the morning? What what we were talking about on the way here? Yeah, what? The the tweet? Yeah, so... I was oh, in... Yeah, we got to get... We get to, yeah. <laughs> I was in Ben's passenger seat, and I got... I got fucking pissed because this this was in my timeline. On Twitter, some guy, some guy, Rob Fraser, wrote this fucking tweet. 
My flight to Vancouver was canceled and it cost me $10,000 to take the ferry instead. And it's one of those ones where it's a long tweet. So you have to click the tweet to see the long thing. And I was like, how the hell did a fucking ferry cost $10,000? So I clicked it. He says, hold up. $10,000 for a 90 minute ferry? Head exploding emoji? Well, sort of. To ferry from Victoria to Vancouver costs $160 and three hours, 15 minutes of my time. To take a seaplane cost me $220 and one hour, 15 minutes of my time. So I saved $60 by taking the ferry, right? No. I value my time at a minimum of $5,000 per hour. Sounds like a lot, but honestly, it's not. So an extra two hours of travel time actually cost me $10,000. I know some people will read this and think I'm an idiot. Yep. But time is everything. You don't get it back. How much would you pay for more time at the end of your life? I'd pay so much more time than $60 to get those two hours back. I think about this with everything I do. And so I was fuming in the passenger seat. And then what did you say to me? I said, what does this guy do? He's got to be like a VC or something. He's got to be like super important. (laughs) And so I was like, I have no idea. And I clicked on his profile and he's a fucking, he he founded a sock company. (laughs) He runs <laughs> Outway socks, incredibly comfortable all day performance uh, socks. Wait, wait, let's go back to his bio real fast. I just want to see what his bio says. Uh, founder slash CEO Outway Socks, nope. scaling a sock business to two to one hundred million plus. Previous pro, pro cyclist. cyclist and five time, time team Kim can t- team Canada. Oh my God. Kim Canada. Kim Canada. Damn, Rob. God bless you, sir. I would ask you to come on the podcast, but we cannot afford your day, your <laughs> yeah, hourly if rate. <laughs> if we run over the hour, we're looking at seventy five hundred bucks. Yeah, something. Jesus Christ! Fuck. Uh, I would try your socks, but I'm pretty good. I'm good, dude. I don't need any. Uh, let's see. Let's see some pictures of these socks. Outway. Oh yeah. Uh, they. Oh, they're like cyclist socks. Are they? I don't know. They just. Uh, do we need more sock companies? Do, do we need more sock companies? God damn. Someone's got to disrupt the industry. It might as well be Rob Fraser. You know what? Maybe we can disrupt it. Uh, Clear socks. Clear socks. I like that. Clear socks. So we can see what's going on. Yeah, so you can see what's going on down there. Quit hiding those piggies. (laughs) (laughs) That's the tagline. (laughs) Quit Quit hiding those piggies. Quit hiding those piggies. Oh, boy. What else was there this morning? I mean, just to rattle it off, BuzzFeed News is being shuttered by uh, Jonah Peretti. And we were, um, I, 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 so for those of you who don't know, I used to work at BuzzFeed years ago and I know that, uh, Disney made an offer to buy BuzzFeed back in like 2014 or 13 or something for like, I don't even remember, $750 million, something like that. It's a nice chunk of change. Yeah. Something, it, it was, it was a nice premium for what they were at the time and it was like peak BuzzFeed. And Jonah Peretti, the CEO, said no. He he, and his president of the company, Jonathan, I can't remember his name, but he was so pissed off. He was like, "Are you insane? Let's take this. Let's take this fucking buyout." And uh, Peretti said no because he had plans for he had more ambitious goals, I guess. And those ambitious goals included running uh, the company into the ground. He d- well, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I don't even think it's his fault. I think, but there's something about executives and founders who they can't like they can't see that things are very good right now but they won't always be this good they're always like no it can only get better from here they they have no ability to go let me get out while the getting's good yes they it's impossible yes so they expanded they opened up offices internationally brazil um london uh where else i think canada a couple others and high went on a hiring spree, including myself. Um, with I, I got started right after they started doing branded content. They like invented branded content. Brandon basically. content. Branded content. Oh. Did I say Brandon? No, I was... Brand, it's content only. This is an episode only for girls, and they made content only for Brandon. I thought they were, or I thought it was like they were getting a bunch of like they got Brandon Boyd from Incubus in to do some <laughs> stuff like. No branded, but uh, they did a big Joe Biden collab. <laughs> oh go brandon yeah. or whatever what is it go brandon yeah let's go, go brandon go joe brandon let's go joe brandon joe brandon um i like that that probably confuses him a little bit oh yeah like why are they calling me brandon yeah 
I, I don't understand. Are they encouraging me? Hey guys, we want to take a quick break to thank another sponsor of today's episode, Rocket Money. Do you know how much your subscriptions cost? Do ya? Well, most Americans think they spend around 80 bucks a month on subscriptions when the actual total is closer to, get this, to... Hundred dollars. Oh my god. If you don't know exactly how much money you're spending every month, you need Rocket Money. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps you lower your bills all in one place. Over eighty percent of people have subscriptions they forgot about and and chances are you're one of them. Like that Stars app just to watch one show or that free gaming trial you never actually used. Rocket Money will quickly and easily find your subscriptions for you. And for any you don't want to pay for anymore, just hit cancel and Rocket Money will cancel it for you. It's that easy. It does sound Rocket Money also helps you manage all your finances in one place and automatically categorize your expenses so you can easily track your budget in real time and also get alerted if anything looks off. You know, I've had plenty of unused subscriptions in my day. In-app purchases that lead to subscriptions that expire on a, you know, they auto renew. Oh, 30-day free trials. Yeah. Oh, you know what's even worse? Sometimes they'll hit you with a six-month free trial and you're like, oh, great. Oh, I've had those. You got to set up and a then, calendar reminder yeah, and then I inevitably forget that. That's why we need Rocket Money, baby. That's when I started saving money with the click of a button with Rocket Money. Over 3 million people have used Rocket Money, saving the average person up to $720 a year. Stop throwing your money away. Cancel unwanted subscriptions and manage your expenses the easy way by going to rocketmoney.com slash trill. That's rocketmoney.com slash trill. Rocketmoney.com slash trill. But, uh... I got hired at their peak valuation. I think it was like $1.2 billion. And I remember getting the chance to buy stock options. And I was like, okay, I could buy it at a $1.2 billion valuation. Do I think that it could even double from here? And I was like, no, fuck yeah. no, there's no way. So now they're, I mean, the stock today was down to like 60 cents because of this news about uh, BuzzFeed News shuttering. But Jonah Peretti put out, this long note internally and then it got published on Twitter where he ba he took ownership of a lot of it. He he said that um if I'm remembering right, like we you know, I I I he did blame a lot of it on the SPAC market drying up by the time that they went public. Just public markets in general, the pandemic, the supply chain, just everything. But um he says that they're more committed than ever to keeping costs down and growing revenues and still thinks that they are poised to like be the next big media fucking thing. Yeah, just to be clear, it's just BuzzFeed news shutting down. All yeah. the other arms are Tentacle. still intact. They said that they're going to reduce <clears throat> the Los Angeles footprint from four buildings down to one. I didn't even know that they had four. Four buildings, yeah. Yeah, Jesus <laughs> Christ. And I think New York, they're going to reduce their footprint too. They're just, you know, they're really consolidating and getting it down. But I personally, I feel bad for the guy is what I was saying because you had this chance to cash out and just be happy and live your fucking life. But now you're answering to not only pissed off employees, but pissed off shareholders. Yep. The market that you've got to now, he's got this whole new set of responsibilities dealing with being a public company. The board. And yeah, and the fucking stocks and the shitter. And I would think about ugh. it every day. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I would go, you fucking fool. Oh, yeah. I'd be embarrassed. I'd be too embarrassed to have sex with my own wife. Be like, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry we're dealing with this. Actually, his wife's probably fine. But anyway. At, uh, I wonder how much he values sex his... Sex with my own wife. Yeah. I wonder how much he values his I want them to at. put that on your tombstone. A too embarrassed to have sex with his own wife. With your own wife. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, what else happened today? The SpaceX rocket blew up, too. SpaceX rocket blew up. Yeah, big rocket go boom. <clears throat> there were so many rockets on the bottom of that thing. Big old hunk and Well, you got to make it thing. a big explosion. Yeah. It looked like a bunch of them weren't working. It it wasn't like a perfect cluster of Raptor engines or whatever. Yeah. I hope Elon Musk shit his pants a little bit. Just a little bit. No, he's going to talk about how this is good for the company. Yeah. Oh, we'll get to that, folks. We'll get to that. All right. Let's dive in, you shall we? You want to get some meat? 
Some meat? The meat? Yeah, that was just the appetizer. Yeah, let's get into some meat and potatoes. What kind of appetizer was it, do you think? Chicken wing? Uh, it was like little vegetables and stuff like um, Brussels sprouts and like that were kind of charred. Yeah, ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, asparagus. You know what it wasn't? It wasn't pathetic little smaller than shoestring uh, french fries. Those do suck. Those fucking suck. Fuck. Okay, so let's let's get back on track here. <laughs> Wedge potato fries, just big old fat wedges. Okay. What's going on, Emil? We want to talk about the WGA strike. What's the WGA? The Writers Guild of America. And what do they do? They represent uh, TV writers. TV, what? TV writers. TV writers. It sounded like I said TE. Yeah, TV yeah. writers. Mm hmm. In, can you guess what country? The United States of America? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, because that's what the A stands for, WGA. WGA. Yeah. WGA. WGA. So they, <clears throat> they recently. So they have a contract up in May 1st and they if they can't come to a new deal with with the networks they're going to networks and studios they're going to um they they've authorized the strike. It was it was overwhelming. Um 97.5% yeah, so or something. 97.85% of ballots were cast in favor of authorizing a strike with a record 79% of el- eligible members turning out to vote. Yeah, for those so other people. <clears throat> they're voted to. They're authorizing a strike if their leadership does not reach a tentative agreement with the Alliance of Motion Pictures and Television Producers, which includes Netflix, Amazon, yeah. ABC, Disney, all of, all of the big players. And a lot, right? you might be sitting at home going, "Why do these lazy writers who have a cool job? Why are they complaining?" Well, they got a lot to complain about. They do. So the. <clears throat> It it comes back. It comes down to a, things that are affecting a lot of industries. Honestly, it's like a lot of people are calling it the gigification of the writing industry because it used to be it used to be a viable career, and t- the TV landscape was very different. Um, you know, pretty much up until recently, the 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 major places that had TV shows were just the the major networks, right? right? And they all had kind of rigid schedules. There was, you know, there was dedicated seasons like pilot season mm-hmm. where people would have the pilots were the first episode you would do of a TV show where, you know, they would they would film a whole pilot and then they would decide to pass on it or not or green light it. <clears throat> and that, those seasons would run for anywhere from like 22 to 26 episodes. So that's quite a long. Long season. That's a long season where you're making a lot of money on that. You would also get something called residuals. Right. Where the more, if those episodes air again and again and again over time, part of your contract stipulates that you get residuals. You get, um, because ads are sold when those episodes air and you get a little chunk of it. You get a little, nice little payday. Right. Not so much with streamers. Even that, the whole ad thing was a completely different thing where they, they used to have the upfronts, which I believe was usually in May where it was like all the networks would, would uh, come and release their schedules and everything and the shows they're going to have and advertisers would come and buy ad space. Yes, they would buy them up front. Yeah. Hence the name. But things have changed drastically. Yeah, now you've got seasons are drastically shorter. You got Netflix seasons being like half as many episodes. I mean, or sometimes it depends, you know. I, sh- there's mini series. there's... I feel like a TV show you're you're probably most people are watching if it's not on network TV could be anywhere from like four to ten episodes. Right, and so that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just because that can uh, lead to just more shows being produced and quicker because it does happen quicker. But there's no rules in place. So the last the last uh, I believe the last contract negotiation was in 2007, right? No, there was one in. That that was well, the last time they went on strike. The last time they went on strike, and that lasted a hundred days. Yes, right. And that was uh, a very interesting time because you had I, I remember like Conan O'Brien, for example, late night with Conan O'Brien had. Oh, that was actually a very fun. He was remember when he was spinning the ring. No. So basically, his his writers went on strike. Yeah. <clears throat> and they so they couldn't produce original content, mm-hmm. but they still wanted to do the show. So they would do weird things. He would he would interview segment producers. He would, and then you know they were making fun of the fact that they couldn't do things. And he was like, "For our next segment, I'm going to spin my my wedding ring, and we're going to see how long 
it will last. And <clears throat> so that's, those are usually the first things to go because. Late night programs? Well, yeah, because they're they're produced on a daily basis, right? So oh, right, right. A lot of th- right. a lot of pe- people are wondering what will happen, and so I think you're talking about 2017 when a strike was authorized, but mm-hmm. they did not actually go on strike. So the, yeah. right now, a strike is authorized. It does not mean they will go on strike. It means if they don't come to a deal or a tentative agreement, they will end up going on strike. But yeah, so I mean, when things are in the can, it's fine. They can come out, right? But daily shows, late night shows, whatever. Yeah. Those are basically like recorded in a day. Yes. It all happens so fast. So they don't have a bunch backlogged. Right. Like movies, it's going to take a long time for movies to be affected. If they go on strike, it'll weirdly, you'll have a weird 2024 probably. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> because <clears throat> they're made so far in advance. Right. Yeah. So it, it all like slowly happens. And then animated shows will likely, most will not be affected. They are usually a part of IATSE, uh, animated writers. Yeah. So it's a different union entirely. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. But, <clears throat> but yeah, so, and so what ends up happening is the, you know, the networks and the studios kind of paint two different pictures when they're talking about this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, when they're talking to, when they're talking about like the changing landscape of entertainment, when they're talking to like Wall Street and investors and shareholders and everything, they're like, we're at the cutting edge. Oh, yeah. Sure, the landscape is changing, but we know how to navigate it. We are going to be doing all these things. And, and they do, right? They, they've been successfully navigating it. You know? But when they come to the negotiating table with writers and guilds, they're like, uncertainty all around. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't even know if we'll be able to afford it keep the lights on yeah we're probably fucked yeah and you guys are greedy you want us to give you minimums yeah on stuff so the wga has been talking about this how they have been pretty adept at navigating these things and you know the some of these uh this uncertain this uncertainty they've been talking about with the streaming services and stuff like it did come with major investments upfront investments where you know Companies were buying up IP to fill out these big libraries and stuff, but subscribers are going up and there is 2022 was a weird year for pretty much every industry. Right. So you're having weird things with the discovery Warner, right. HBO max. Right. And they're doing all these write downs on, on these, on this IP that they no longer want anymore. But that's, you know, aberrational. They, their profits, their op- the operating profits of the entertainment industry have been on the rise steadily. You know, they are not losing out in the way they like to claim they are. And there's plenty of money. CEO pay is like at all time highs, of course. But they're saying they don't have the money to pay, you know, writers these things. And then there's other things. There's other things happening with um, things called mini rooms. Did you read about the mini rooms? The mini rooms are where they get a bunch of writers before a show starts. Well, not a bunch. That's the thing. Or, yeah, a a couple. Right. So it's usually a showrunner and a couple, uh, a couple or a few writers, and they kind of like break out ideas for pilots, and they don't... It's also a way to go around, like you don't have to pay the same minimum fees, you can save money, these types of things. So they're trying to like end a lot of these practices too and be, you know, taken care of. Um, So they're... Doing these little, whereas normally they would pay people individually to write pilots and buy the scripts and stuff. They're now just doing these flat rate kind of breakout little mini writer's right. rooms. And then, hey, whatever ideas you come up with, we own them. Right. Cool. Awesome. And obviously people are going to say yes to that because they need to pay rent and whatnot. Right. But so the big thing, part of the reason why these media companies are seeing increases in profits and increases in CEO pay because of the performance of these companies is because, <clears throat> excuse me, the streaming models obviously benefit the companies way more now than the traditional model used to also benefit the writers and whatnot. And that's what the WGA is fighting for, is there needs to be amendments to these rules and regulations so that writers can more fairly participate in uh, 
the profits from the from this shift to streaming right because it's now there's no more residuals there's no more there are shorter seasons so there's got to be some they're arguing that like there's got to be some kind of way to account for they're still very popular programs they're still there are well, millions that's the thing. Of they're they're arguing streaming. that <clears throat> you know like the the production companies and uh, networks and stuff are arguing that well the TV landscape is just different now those days are over where you could just be a TV writer and you can have your 26 season show and mm. make all that money but and so they're saying there's just not enough money to go around but that's just not true right when you know it was like in 2000 operating profits for the entertainment companies were at like 5 billion mm-hmm. in 2019 we were at like 50 billion Seriously, that on, much, let that me find. 10 fucking so in two thousand combined, this is from the this is from the WGA. In two thousand combined, entertainment operating profits of major networks slash studios was five billion dollars. In twenty nineteen, the profits, including new streaming platforms like Netflix, were fifty billion dollars. God damn. Hey, guys, we want to take a quick break to thank another sponsor of today's episode, BetterHelp. You know. Recently, I've learned a lot of new things about myself, and that experience was uh, at times volatile, traumatic, but overall beneficial. And it changed my life by allowing me to grow and learn. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, Mm -hmm. especially because we're always growing and changing. Mm -hmm. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do, until we talk through things. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on that journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Therapy rocks, okay, everybody? It straight up rocks. You get to talk to a captive audience about your problems, and then they help you figure out why you're dealing with the stuff you're dealing with and give you practical solutions to handle it better. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com trill today to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P, dot com slash trill. Right. And so they're, you know, and not only that, now they're, they're raising prices Mm -hmm. as they're trying to grow subscribers. And a bunch of them are about to turn on these, the ad supported content. Yeah. Netflix. Right. And, you know, but, and that's the thing. So the WGA kind of has, they did like a little timeline of this too, right? This is, none of this is new. Uh, They, they tried to do this kind of at every, at every new juncture right they talk about the rise of cable channels and how they started to be like oh well this is going to change it we're not sure how. and so they said like the rise of cable channels in the early 2000s was projected to fragment audiences and end the mass audience programming era of broadcast instead the leg- legacy media companies expanded into cable creating new networks to monetize broadcast content and, and expand their original production the companies then rode the growth of cable subscriptions in the u.s and around the world to record profits in the u.s alone Basic basic cable affiliate fees, the payments cable operators make to cable networks for the right to package the networks to subscribers, have grown from $6.7 billion in 2000 to $36 billion in 2015, and then to $40 billion annually for the past several years. And they they talk about that, how it just, that happens every time, you know, when they started exporting IP all around the world and that, you know... bringing sh- branching shows out internationally and all that kind of stuff. They were like, this is going to change everything. We don't know what to do with all this uncertainty. And now you're finally seeing it with like streaming services, streaming services and online v- viewing. It kind of reminds me of uh, the record companies back in, back when Napster changed everything by, if you guys don't know what Napster is, fucking Google it. But uh, peer-to-peer sharing of music was a big, big deal fucking 20 years ago however long ago because people could do it for free and the record companies were in a panic because they're like whoa shit we're gonna go bankrupt from this like we can't work this way and it changed it disrupted the whole music industry and um then itunes obviously came and like kind of saved the day because they made it so that well you can buy songs piecemeal so it also takes a bit of the guesswork out of downloading these programs where you can sometimes get viruses and stuff but now record companies are fucking more profitable than ever 
Is that true? I believe so. I remember reading that they're like, they're doing great. Streaming, they finally adapted and now they know how to actually make shit work and they're fucking killing it. I mean, so the same thing is happening here. It's like, and I, I think musicians get, as usual, the creatives, the artists and shit get the shit under the stick. But um, I was going to say, that's kind of the story for oh, the yeah. creative industry. The creative industry and nonprofits. It's, um, you well, can, it's in the name, man. <laughs> well, You're not supposed to make a profit. No, there's plenty of money to be made. In, really? No. I, yeah. Okay. But nonprofits and, and I feel like creative industries, it's people who d- definitely want to be doing the work. So, it's that you find a lot of people underpaid. Right. Every and nonprofit is like, there's like 20 people getting paid anywhere from like 45 to $55,000. And then there's like six people on the board getting paid like for nothing, $400,000. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, the other big thing is there, the WGA wants to uh, have AI regulated in some kind of capacity. They want assurances from these companies that AI, that they're not going <clears> to <throat> circumvent human creativity and rely on AI in, I don't know what they're laying out, but I'm assuming that it's like, you cannot use fucking AI. Right. I mean, that would be huge, especially, I I would hope that, I don't know if the visual effects industry yet has a union. I know that they were trying for a long time to, to unionize, but the VFX industry, those people get work to the fucking bone anyway. And I would think that they're all terrified of, of AI. And I don't know if, yeah, if, if this would be limited to just, obvi- I think it would be just limited to writing, but, um, cause that's what they missed a couple of contracts ago is they didn't, nobody could foresee what streaming would eventually become and how profitable it would be and how it would change the whole landscape. So that's, again, that's why they're negotiating for this is because hey things are changing rapidly they have changed we need to be compensated uh commensurate with that and just i don't want to miss it but so the wga they basically summed up what they're actually looking for so in addition to standard issues like higher minimum compensation and increased contributions to healthcare and retirement funds writers priorities include standardizing residuals for feature writers regardless of whether their work is released in theaters or on streaming Mm. curbing the use of the much hated mini rooms applying contract minimums to comedy variety shows made for new media and addressing the issue of artificial intelligence and yeah i mean that stuff's all important so more and more people are being paid the minimum people are being paid less as as their um as the studios are making more money so they said as the pandemic accelerated the shift to streaming which now accounts for the majority of writing work in the industry writers haven't shared in the prosperity a march wga report finds that writer pay has declined four percent over the past decade 23 percent when adjusted for inflation and 49 percent of television ri- series writers are compensated at the contract minimum compared to 33% in 2013, 2013. So more and more writers are being paid the minimum. The minimum's pretty good still, but Jesus, when you're not working consistently. It's, it's, that's the thing. It's not really. So, I mean, both of us probably have a lot of friends that are TV writers. Yes. And it's it's weird because, like, in my mind, it's, it's, it's like it used to be, right? You, you get you get hired as a TV writer and it's like, you're making pretty good money. And yeah. <clears throat> you're seeing, you know, talking to friends and not only I'm seeing a lot of it on Twitter where people are like, I have been consistently writing for whatever, five years yeah. and I'm constantly struggling. I'm on food stamps. It's like, Whoa. I mean, dude, I mean, it, so if you get like two Netflix shows, right. One's like a six part series and one's like a 10 it's not even, it's, you didn't even do like a full season of TV before, yeah. right? You're stringing. I have friends who are like, oh, I won't even take gigs sometimes because it just might, it's it's not worth it for me to leave whatever I was doing to go write in an eight week room and make $20,000 and then I'm like out on my ass again. Yeah. Well, I mean, oh, because whatever they were doing. Because, right. They're like, I have a steady non-creative job or something like that a lot of people have to work jobs that they're not necessarily right they're like oh this is just to hold me over until the next creative job but they're like yeah i do want to write for that tv show but who knows when what happens one. when it ends yeah yeah i i lived with a tv writer i dated one and i remember how stressful it was it's fucking stressful and i seeing that i was like i don't want to do this because I, I remember having that ambition. Like, oh, I'd get into TV writing. Nah, not for me. 
<laughs> podcasting, baby. That's where it's Podcasting's at. Podcasting's <laughs> where it's at. Uh, but yeah, I mean, anyone who's like, people should go re- read the WGA statement. It's it's quite long, but they're they're talking about like kind of the state of the industry and everything and <clears throat> how far we've come from being able to make and make a living off of this and well speaking of uh making money we got earnings season coming or happening right now um oh netflix yeah we got netflix too uh we'll get to that in a sec but according to bofa we we all know bofa Bank of America. Bank of America. Of the 10% of the S&P 500 companies that have reported earnings so far, 90% have beat earnings per share and 73% have beat on sales. That's a big deal because everybody has been talking about and anticipating this uh, slump in in EPS and in sales, and it's just kind of not happening like everybody thought. A big part of that is banks. Banks have um, just been fucking killing it. Citigroup reported. Big banks have been killing it. Big banks, it. yeah. JP Morgan, fucking like, I think they had a 50% beat on their estimates. Citigroup, uh, if I already said that. Um, but yeah, it, it runs, this narrative kind of runs counter to what the best analyst of 2022, Mike Wilson, continues to say, which is that top line growth, which is revenues and whatnot, has been inflated by high GDP, inflation, and pricing power. Because, you know, like the gas companies is a good example of pricing power, where, hey, too bad, so sad, you guys need gas. We got it, bitch. Uh, That's what they said. They pretty much did. They put out a statement. OPEC. We got OPEC it, bitch. said, suck it, bitch. Do you remember what it stands for? Fuck. OPEC stands for only petroleum. Oh, oh. Oil and petroleum no. exporting. Fuck. What does it stand for? Do you not remember either? It's petroleum exporting countries. Uh, Oil. It's organization. 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 Petroleum ex- exporting countries, yeah. That's what I said. What did I say? Yeah, no, I think you said, I said oil and petroleum. Yeah. Hey, guys, we want to take a quick break to thank another sponsor of today's episode, our one of our favorites, Shopify. Ooh, folks, you hear that? You should know what that means already. Shopify is the commerce platform revolutionizing millions of businesses worldwide. Whether you're selling flaky salt or fine art prints, Shopify simplifies selling online and in person so you can focus on successfully growing your business. Shopify covers every sales channel from an in-person POS system to an all-in-one e-commerce platform. It even lets you sell across social media marketplaces like TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram. Packed with industry-leading tools ready to ignite your growth, Shopify gives you complete control over your business and your brand without having to learn any new skills in design or code. And thanks to 24-7 help and an extensive business course library, Shopify is there to support your success every step of the way. That's the best part about it, okay? No matter how big you want to grow, Shopify is there to empower you with the confidence and control to revolutionize your business and take it to the next level. Now it's your turn to get serious about selling and try Shopify today. This is Possibility powered by Shopify. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash trill, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash trill to take your business to the next level today. Shopify.com slash trill trill uh well anyway all of that uh top line growth has been has more than offset the drag from higher costs because inflation and supply chain stuff has led to higher costs but all of those tailwinds have more than offset that hence these record margins we're seeing but mike wilson maintains that once those tailwinds die down in the next few quarters margins are going to compress and so will earnings And he continues to say in this note the other day that falling inflation for goods is a sign of waning demand. Like inflation coming down is good and everybody in the market's fucking giddy about it. But he's pointing out that that's actually a sign of demand slowing down. And inflation is actually the one thing holding up the revenue growth that you're seeing for a lot of these businesses. So Because it's not inflation. It was just them fucking artificially propping up their prices. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, I mean, yeah. it's just like. Yeah, that's the pricing power. 
So these gradually eroding margins uh, have mostly been, he says, a function of bloated cost structures. If and when revenues begin to disappoint, that margin, de- that margin degradation can be uh, much more sudden. And then these two strategists from Black uh, got Blackrock, Blackrock. <laughs> these two strategists from Blackrock, uh, Jean Bio Boivin, Jean Bovin, Jean Bovin, Jean Bovin, and Wei Li, Wei Li, Wei Li, Ze. <laughs> Said, Why is it fine to do it for the French person? <laughs> said, even with results expected to slump the most in three years, that will not reflect the, quote, coming damage yet. So, like, these people are, uh, I mean, it's interesting that the number one analyst of 2022 is still saying, like, y'all, the worst is yet to come. But at the same time, I was reading that these, so you know how they've got these uh, same-day expiration options now? No. So, like in in the S and P in in the in in the uh, Nasdaq in the big indexes, yeah, it used to be, it used to just be like monthly, and then it was down to I'm getting this wrong, so excuse me, but it was weekly, and then it was three days a week: Monday, Wednesday, Friday expirations. Mm-hmm. And now they've got every single day of the week has expirations. So, what that's doing, according to some, is you have people piling into put options, betting that the market's going to go down, right? But that acts as this, like, it's like trying to sink a beach ball effect. I can sink a beach ball. You could sink, I'm sure you could. But <laughs> the... the um, My wife's trying to get me to come back to the shore. <laughs> Shut up! I'm almost there. Sinking this fucking... But these, op- these put options that are being sold, well, someone is selling those. They're the dealers. The dealers selling those put options hedge against those put options by buying the index, by buying the futures, by buying the underlying. And then the put options just shrink and shrink in value. And then people are now aware of that. So one strategy a lot of people are employing is then buying call options, which then just kind of has this feedback loop where the dealers hedging against the puts that they sold combined with the call buying option just keeps the market in this perpetual just like it's just not going to drop and it it's very frustrating and the vix just keeps getting compressed and going lower and lower the vix is at like fucking 16 now which is wild there's like no there's no risk out there it seems uh, or yeah the, the, that fat tail is it's out there, but it's way far away. And what I mean by that is the risk that this will all just kind of unwind and then you'll see a negative feedback loop just feels ever increasingly unlikely. Because then the more everybody's anticipating it to happen or thinking surely it's going to happen, the more le- the less likely it is to happen because everybody's positioned for it. I everybody's mean, bracing for we're it. We're at close to a year now of just everyone's fucked. Yeah, but like, look at the market. Like, I know. Nothing seems to be that fucked. If... But it's still projected to come, recession 2023. Yeah, yeah. Makes you think. So Netflix uh, reported earnings. They added only only 1.75 million subscribers, missing their 2.3 million estimate. Um, did you hear about their their love is blind foibles? I was seeing on Twitter people making jokes about like... yeah. Netflix trying to do a live stream, or and I was like, "What are they live streaming?" Yeah, <laughs> I couldn't the, figure it out. The Love Is Blind reunion, I guess. What is that? Is that blind people love it? <laughs> I don't. Know. Well, that's a fair question. I mean, love on the love spectrum, on the spectrum. Yeah, which yeah. was autistic people. No, Love Is Blind is a blind date show where people don't oh. see each other and they get to know each other and decide if they want to get married or something. Yeah, but oh, that's like the classic. Uh... The dating game? Yeah, where you're Yeah, like, but that's just one episode. Suitor number three. Yeah. My dad was on that show twice. Did he get picked? No. <laughs> no, he didn't. Uh in his episode. Wait, is that what What? Is that what the Netflix style one is? No. The Netflix <laughs> one is all these people are in some big fucking compound and they they never see each other and they're just taking turns going into different rooms and talking to different people and getting to know each other. And then they kind of, you, you see who's starting to fall for who and the relationships yeah. that form. Right. But they, uh, when people were trying to watch it, they were getting all these messages like sit tight. Eventually we're going to, but it didn't happen. 
Oh, it just never came on? Well, it did. It took a few hours, but like eventually it did come on. Um, but, you know, people were going off and watching Succession and Yellow Jackets and other shit. But, uh, oh, it was Sunday. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to figure out what the fuck. Uh, I thought maybe they were live streaming Coachella or something. <laughs> I couldn't figure it out. But they've done. people were mad about Frank Ocean. And I was like, is all this connected? Yeah. Um, apparently Frank Ocean wanted like all the lights on the entire fairgrounds turned off for his performance. And then he had like an ice skating rink. Yeah, but he it, busted his ankle or it, something. No, in the last, like, t- right before going on, he said, I don't want this anymore. So they had to go and break down the ice skating rink and stuff and just, it seemed weird. I don't know. Now he dropped out. He's not doing the second week. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, he I saw missed. that. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, too bad. <laughs> um, But so it was actually their second, they did the Chris Rock live stream and it went off without a hitch. It was totally fine. So it's like they've... They're still trying to figure out the live thing, but um, in their earnings, they said that they were, quote, very pleased with their new ad tier and that password crackdowns are slowly unrolling, I think, in Latin America first and then coming here. But Do you think um, it made people realize, hey, maybe we should have given Trillionaire Mindset a little more slack for having like a weird sound issue? Yeah, you know? Okay. At least we fucking ended up on air, didn't we? You it just goes to show jackasses. that doing it is hard. <laughs> There's a lot of moving parts. Yes. Fucking creeps. Jesus fucking Christ. <laughs> not you go- not you girls. Yeah. It's we're talking to the boys only. You fucking boys. Go dig some, go go eat some dirt. <laughs> go eat some dirt. You morons. Have a, have some have some sunny D. You fucking absolute I will idiot. say because there's no boys watching, it's just girls. Yeah. Aren't boys smelly? No, no, no. They're just fucking mean. Like the, boys. Whenever I get mean messages, it's always some fucking Yeah. I look at it as like stupid fucking AVI. AVI? What is it? Don't girls profile picture back me on this one. Jesus Christ. What are you a, a fucking Gen Xer? <laughs> this sucks. What do you have a what do you what did you use a, did you have a Hotmail account? AVI. Oh what are you supposed God. to say? Profile picture, man. No, that's a, on Twitter they would say uh, oh yeah, Avi that's true. or whatever yeah, the yeah. fuck. Avi, it's short for Avi- Avatar. Right, whatever. I didn't want to say yeah. Avi. Yeah, you piece of shit. Yeah. I told you, boys are mean. But every time, yeah, it's some guy, and they're like committed to being fucking dicks. Yeah, and then you, and then you're like, oh, I'm sorry you feel that way, and then they go, I was just kidding, dude. Dude, I was. Just- I love you. <laughs> right. I was just trying to get your attention. I am so sorry. It's because they don't know how to show any affection, and they're yeah. just like, I'm gonna tell him he sucks. And then he'll maybe give me some attention. That's the same way they are with girls. One guy okay. goes. Uh, actually, I don't even want to give. I, I don't want to give any of these people yeah, their okay. fucking right. attention. Well, in other news, Netflix is winding down their DVD services. To I bet there is not a single person in our audience who gives a shit because not a single. person. I can't is, believe it was still fucking going. I can't believe it went on for twenty five <laughs> yeah. years. I remember getting them the first. I do too. At my yeah. I my remember parents. Blockbuster <clears throat> had a DVD service that was superior because you could go swap it out at the Blockbuster store. Right, that's a nice. I was like, I could go right now and swap it out, and you paid a flat rate every month. DVD.com is what it's. Oh wow, that's what it's called now, huh? You can get cocaine bear. Cocaine bear. What are they going to do with all those old discs? Is what Sell I want to know. Box. They sell them to Redbox. Yeah. Yes. Well, anyway, the other big news this week, Tesla had their earnings. And I have to wonder, Emil. What? What are you wondering? Are people, and when I say people, I mean Tesla permables, um, which is, of course, the crowd that believes that Elon Musk is Jesus Christ reincarnate and can not do any wrong and that Tesla is actually a software company. It's a technology company. It's not a, a car company. Which, sure, fine, I'll give you that. But I have to wonder, after all the bullshit that has come out of Elon's mouth and has not only failed to live up to expectations, but in some cases fully failed to come to fruition, are they close to just not believing the shit that he says? I I gotta wonder. I, I mean, I, who knows? He, his whole thing now is just completely different than it was even just like, in September, right? It's now he's all wrapped up in his like woke, oh, anti, battling yeah. anti woke crusade. So his whole persona has kind of like changed. Uh, 
Yeah, I don't know. Because one of the things that he said on their uh, earnings call is he said that Tesla is in a uniquely strong strategic position. Tesla is in a uniquely strong strategic position because we are the only ones making cars that technically we could sell for zero profit for now and then yield tremendous economics in the future through autonomy. No one else can do that. Like, he's... <laughs> we, could, we could sell the cars, we could give them away for free, but we would still profit the most because of autonomy in the future. And it's like, brother, brother my brother in Jesus Christ... You have been saying that for almost 10 years now, and it ain't any, anywhere even close. And now, you not only that, but you got way more competition than you did before. Yeah, and now everyone kind of fucking hates you. Yeah, and now everybody <laughs> fucking hates you. Also, they keep <laughs> Including lowering Including some prices. of your kids. <laughs> they keep lowering prices. Why am I going to buy a Tesla today when it's very likely that they might lower prices by another 10% in a couple weeks? Ooh, you're holding out. Yeah. Right. The, what is it? Like five times five times since this, in the last year or something? They've lowered their prices. Yeah. And quite then, significantly, too. And you've got competition. I mean, part of the bull case is that they're they're um, starting in this totally untapped market in Asia. But then China's own uh, BYD company announced an $11,400 electric vehicle coming to the market. I mean, that's really what we need. I would fucking love that. It's called the, what is it called? The Seagull. Imagine me that. in that thing. Scoot, scoot, beep, beep. Yeah. <laughs> Get in, losers. We're going saving the planet or whatever. You know what I mean? Like the, the <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Uh, this Morgan Stanley research note. A flock of seagulls? BYD's $11,000 car. Another sign of EV deflation heading to our shores. Do you know if uh, they just released... Because now I think there's only 10 cars, including all electric and plug-in hybrids, that qualify for the the full $7,500 rebate. I don't From think... the federal government? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if we can Google that, but I'm curious if, if Tesla is still on there. Yeah, they are. Because um, I believe that buried in their earnings report was about $500 million worth of those credits were attributed to their... Yeah, but I think as of recently, the... Cash flows. The rules have changed and everything. Oh. I don't know. Can we Google that? How would you phrase that? 10 cars eligible for... Just command F Tesla. Oh, Tesla. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The so the um. Yeah. Those are the, the Model Three and the Model Three Long Range are eligible. Oh. Oh, oh. only the. Mo oh no 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 no. no this I don't think this is the right list, but. No, it is. Oh, okay. So all of, all of the Teslas. Yeah. Interesante. So Tesla's earnings, though. They had an increase in revenue while they saw a drop in profits. So revenues were higher, but their margins were down, as was free cash flow, which actually would have been negative were it not for that $500 million in regulatory credits. So not very good. You don't want to see that because this is supposed to be this growth company. And suddenly it would appear as though uh, even though top line growth is continuing, those margins, man, they're starting to get squeezed because you got the competition coming your way. And if suddenly Tesla's profitability story starts to change, oh boy, look out. I mean, they do have a record cash stockpile of $22 billion, but that can go pretty damn quickly. And I'm curious to see how they're going to utilize that. They might announce a stock buyback, which the market would probably love. Or maybe it wouldn't because it's like if I were a shareholder, I'd want to see them do smarter things with that cash, especially as margins are starting to compress a little bit, you know? Like what? I don't I don't even know. What the fuck are you going to do with it? Buy more Bitcoin. Open another gigafactory. Open another gigafactory. In China. And there's also, I mean, there are a lot of things up ahead for them. They, I think Elon was saying that their energy capture business has grown and that's like the next big phase there's always there's always something else with him oh we're also doing this and we're also like i mean uh, yeah that's his whole fucking thing yeah i'm just tired i, I mean they're always you know they're gonna put chips in our head soon mm. we'll be, i hope they're sun chips <laughs> we'll be living in we'll be living in weird bubbles on mars soon yeah so the other huge news that i've been getting a lot of messages about the apple savings account they announced it months ago, but they're only finally rolling it out. They partnered with Goldman Sachs. 
Uh, it is a savings account with a 4.15% annual interest rate. That is 10 times the national average of 0.35%. There's no fees or minimums. Um, they also just announced, I, I didn't Right, guess. and even like that 0.35% is even high for, for example, on my Chase savings account. Yeah. I'm getting 0.01%. It's pathetic. That's uh, part of the reason why Chase's margins were so good and why their profit was right. so because they're not paying out. Banks should be giving more yield on, on yeah. these savings accounts. Yes. And hopefully this kind of shit encourages... I mean, I saw it and I was like, fuck, maybe I'll just open an Apple savings account. Yeah. Um, there are also a couple other accounts you can get a little bit higher, but it's, it's yeah, they're negligible. From, they're from um, random banks and they're not going to be as easy. What you're getting with this also right. is the convenience. And there's... Fucking Apple is just... They're the smartest... Right. The goal is to get more like they want you fully wrapped up in Apple's entire yes, environment atmosphere. Yeah. So in order to get the savings account, you have to first get the Apple credit card. Right. right? That was what where I was like, I don't fucking want another credit card. Yeah. And they offer, I believe, uh, where is it? All purchases get you one percent. Ca- Whoa. What the fuck? All purchases get you one percent cash back. And then I believe two uh, percent cash back when you use Apple Pay. And so what happens is the cash normally just sits there like a checking account right. and you can use it to pay off bills or just use for Apple Pay. And now it'll but, go into this higher yield yeah, savings account. Yeah, now you account, can maybe. just, the click of a button, opt to have it funnel into the savings account and just make money and you're not paying any fees. You're not, it's, I think, I mean, I can't give financial advice and I'm not, but like, damn, I might even look into this because <clears throat> if, uh, if you're looking to just make extra cash on your cash... Fuck it, man. I that's... mean, most ba- most major banks, like if you deal with, you know, Chase, Capital One, you know, Wells Fargo, you're probably getting like 0.01%. Yeah. This, you know, those higher rates are, it's always a regional bra- bank, a weird brain. Why do I want to say brain so bad? Why do I want to say brain so bad? Uh, <laughs> the, the ones where you get the higher ones are, you know, I have people who... I'm sure it's fine, but I don't want to open a bank account with like Ally or whatever. Yeah, you know what me I mean? Neither. So, but like part of the thing is they have, there's over 2 billion active Apple devices and doing something like this just further ropes people in and makes it even ever harder for them to switch hardware. Right. It's like you're an Apple person for life now, especially when you're now incorporating. Oh dude. You're I've, a bank now too. When Apple pay came out, I was like, I'm never going to use that. Like how hard it is. How hard is it to pull out your card? Right. Yeah. I use it all the time. Yeah. It's I, like to the point where sometimes I forget my wallet. Cause I'm like, I'll just fucking Apple pay. Yeah. And I only recently started using it because you told me. I know. I was like, dude, why don't you ever, it's great. And I said, cause it doesn't work. And you're like, yes, it does. It always, dude, The my favorite thing is the Apple watch. I could do it on Apple watch. And like when we're in New York, I just, Tap it to, Tap go, on it the to go on the subway. Fucker. It's very cool. Uh, what I thought was interesting is it basically goes in line with what Jamie Dimon, the CEO of JP Morgan, said about um, or talked about. And one of the many things that he talked about in his annual shareholder letter. And if you have a minute and you're interested in reading some really boring shit, Google the Jamie Dimon annual shareholder letter because he's like, you know, he's one of the. I mean, we don't have to pull it up, but because it's just so fucking long. But um, one of the things that he points out in the shareholder letter is risks to the industry, to the economy, and in particular to uh, like his bank. And he said that technology companies pose one of the biggest risks. I mean, obviously, he knew by the time he was writing it that they were going to be coming out with this. But uh, yeah, that big tech rivals could very well take customers. And it looks like they're already starting to fucking do that. I'm seriously considering an Apple account. (laughs) Just to get the thing. I mean, it's not a bad idea just to like have, if you're already, I'm personally not a huge cash back guy because I'm like 1% whoop-de-doo. All right. It's a dollar for every hundred bucks. Right. When you can get points. Right. I just love points, man. Give me the I do too. It's nice knowing I got a little stockpile of like, if I want to fly somewhere. Yeah. It's not real money. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm buying shit with funny money. <laughs> yeah. It's funny money, man. Uh, and the more you got, the more rich you feel. Yeah. And I'm sure it's just personal. Pre- like, you probably save the same amount when it comes down to points and, yeah. and cash back and whatever the fuck. But but it's just um, this Apple shit, man. I remember in 2009, at the bottom of the market, 
when the recession was uh, in in running on all cylinders and apple's stock price was like i don't know 85 bucks a share and i don't even remember what the market valuation was it might have been like 50 billion dollars or something and i remember telling my mom mom you guys need to get all the cash you can and buy as much apple as you can it's like it's not going to go away and it's only going to, and she, I remember she'll deny it, but she said, honey, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and I was like, okay. <laughs> Damn. And I think it increased 50 fold from there. Yeah. About that. Cause 50 times, uh, 50 billion is 2.5 trillion, which Damn. I think is what it maxed out at. So cool. Mom. Thanks mom. I know you're probably walking the dog right now as you listen to this. That's usually what she does. She walks the dog. She's got him in the stroller. She's listening. She's going, she's probably saying out loud, ha ha ha, fuck you, Ben. <laughs> she's probably saying that. Well, you know what? I'm not going to say it back, mom. I love you, mom. All the same, even though you didn't make millions of dollars in Apple. Well, to be fair, neither did I. Anyway. I mean, there's nothing stopping other companies. Like Google, Google has Google Pay. They do. They can partner with banks. Chase. Yeah. They got to partner with someone. I they mean, can partner. Right. They can partner with someone. And Apple's with Goldman Sachs. But I mean, good. Like get people to start offering higher yield savings accounts. Yeah. It's just like also in March, they introduced this Apple Pay Later where you can pay in four equal installments over six weeks with no fees or interest. How the fuck? So you've got like a firm and you've got, what's the other one that does that? Buy Now Pay Later company? There's a firm. Oh, uh, if you're screaming at us right now, I'm so sorry that we're blanking on the other name. But like now, every time you check out, they're yeah, like, like, "Do you, you want to pay six dollars for the next seven years?" And yeah, like, I, I with don't. With a firm, <laughs> I don't. Maybe? It blows my mind how companies like that could even get off the ground because I would think that they would realize like, hey, all Apple has to do is like write some fucking code or whatever and come up. I mean, I know it's more complicated than that but i would never even dream as a vc of investing in something like that 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 i know a huge rival like apple could easily implement and just wipe you out completely well i mean it's not just apple though because it they're plugged into so many things where it just wouldn't be i think it pops up if you like buy something from like a clothing company you know a clothing company you want to buy this shirt over the course of a year (laughs) right And so, I mean, even if Apple did that, and honestly, the first time I saw people getting into Apple credit cards was Apple basically did that. They were like, if you sign up for our credit card, you get 12 months, zero interest. And so that's huge. If you're going to buy a $2,000 computer, you can then pay it off. I mean, they've been doing that for since I was in college. Right, exactly. They were with Barclays Bank, I remember. That was the first time I heard of people getting Apple credit cards, though, when they were doing that. Yeah, I remember that was one of my first credit cards, the Apple. But I didn't get anything for it. I just got fucking No, but you basically zero interest. Yeah, that's a Yeah. Oh man. I mean, it's not easy to drop $2000 uh on a computer. No. And if you do drop it, I, I hope you pick it up. Jeez, somebody's going to come swoop up all that cash. Girls. Don't. Uh what was I going to say about fucking Apple? Uh anyway, well, I guess on that note. Wait. Also, I do want to say it's crazy because before all this was happening, it was just like a, it was like a couple of weeks ago. I was looking at, like my Chase savings account, and I was like, what's the fucking difference between this and a checking? It's just like yeah. the way they named it. I'm getting fucking point zero one percent on this fucking thing. My Amex account earns like four percent APY, and I'm already I've already made like ten bucks on it in the last couple of weeks yeah it's like oh you've made ten dollars i'm like cool man i might just keep that in there someone's doing calculations at home of how much you have in there yeah well that shows that he's got like wow geez um oh goldman sachs i remember what i was gonna say i remember uh i think i might have told this story i was at a i was on a at a bar talking to this girl and what were you guys talking about? It was in New York years ago. And uh, she was asking me what I did. And I was like, oh, I trade stocks. And she goes, she was a little drunk. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, you mean like Goldman Sachs? <laughs> <laughs> and I didn't know if she was kidding. So I just kind of laughed and went, yeah, just like that. Oh, so do you work at like Goldman Sachs? <laughs> <laughs> Wait. 
Yeah, and it was loud. So I said, did you say Goldman, Goldman Saps? And she goes, yeah. <laughs> Isn't that what it's called? And I was like, no, it's Goldman Sachs. And she goes, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I love her. You're lying. But I remember just, I remember kind of just going, are you fucking with me? Because if you are fucking with me, I'm in love with you because you're a comedic genius. Right, right, right. Or you're a fucking moron. Right. Yeah. And which I'm still in love with you. I think she's then said, oh, so like J.P. Morgan's or like Morgan's or something like that? No way. I can't remember, but she got another bank wrong. And I thought, okay, but she ended up being an idiot. Or just very drunk. To do both of them, like, or maybe just some kind of speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> like, to think it's Goldman Sachs and J.P. Mormon. J- Morgan's, I think. J.P. Morgan's. Oh, J.P. Morgan's is fine. Yeah, it's like people who say Barnes and Noble's. Barnes and Noble. Look at the sign. I've not heard someone say Barnes and Noble in <laughs> 10 years. Well, it still exists. Yeah, are you hanging out at the Borders on the weekend? Oh, man. Borders was a bookshop, folks. It was a bookshop <laughs> where we all went to go pee before going to the movies when our parents would drop us off at the local uh, city center. Or, st- or Starbucks. Or Starbucks. Let's. Uh, I wanted to end on a negative note <laughs> here with the Credit Karma thing. Um, there was a survey from Credit Karma, and one in five people, 59 and up, said that they don't have a retirement account. So that's 20% of people, 59 and up, saying they don't have a retirement account, compared to 25%, a quarter of Gen X respondents. of baby boomers said that they've decreased their contributions to retirement because of inflation, and 5% said they can't afford to contribute at all. And then uh, you got to love Gen Z, man. Half of them surveyed said that they are looking to retire early, which is funny because uh, 41% of Gen Z says that their net worth is, I mean, zero dollars or less. But they're also fucking I mean that doesn't yeah that's shit, yeah. that that's that is a bit ridiculous but 38% of millennials say that their net worth is uh, $0 or less right that one is alarming and one in five <laughs> of uh, 59 plus their net worth is zero or less right. so that's those numbers are alarming yeah Gen Z it's like yeah 41% of them are like 18 yeah <laughs> so yeah <laughs> if they yeah. all had a bunch in savings I'd be like can you tell us what you're doing yeah uh, but I mean, none of it is surprising. It's scary. Yeah. I mean, there was that stat going around that was like 50% of people can't afford a $400 emergency or something like that that will financially ruin them. Awesome. We love this system. No, we're doing well. We love America. But yeah, those are, uh, they're scary. Oh boy. Look, we're all just going to work till we die, okay? When we get too old, the, the government will strike some kind of deal with walmart where, where they'll have to take on walmart greeters so we'll all just be You're gonna be a robot dude but someone's gotta someone's gotta talk to the robot someone's gotta be standing there putting in prompts welcome to walmart i'm not gonna know how to put in a prompt when i'm 90 yeah when i'm 90 i'm gonna be smoking cigarettes and just doing hard drugs <laughs> i'll have earned it at that point I, i'm gonna be daring my body to quit Why not? I don't think that's going to be what you're doing. What if I'm 90? I'm not going to be going, well, I might as well try to make it to 100. I'm going to go, damn, everyone I've ever loved is dead. Might as well smoke it out. I know, but <laughs> this is a common story from people, right? Yeah. When I'm when I'm 90. You ever seen a 90-year-old? Imagine trying to get it. Everyone's like, I'm going to try heroin. Trying to get a needle and you're like <laughs> fucking <laughs> stretched out flat like... <laughs> They'll have fucking trying heroin to, vapes. Buddy. Trying to roll a joint with your arthritic. Yeah. I hope I don't get arthritis in my hands. Well, that just about does it for this episode, doesn't it? That that just about does it. That just about does it for this episode of Trillionaire Mindset. And to all the girls out there, you're sick. You're so sick. Boys, you can come back. Girls, you can open the door yeah. and let the boys, boys back in. Boys, turn back around. Unplug your ears. They're covered in dirt. <laughs> they, no, they've been doing that ear thing where it goes, and they're just making themselves laugh. 
Man, this is cool. I can't wait to go in the fridge and get some Sunny D. We love you. Yeah, we love you very As much. Always. We're gonna be doing after hours now. We're gonna be talking about all sorts of stuff. AI, nine eleven. Or wait, no. Whether or not AI did nine <laughs> eleven. Uh we're gonna be talking about all sorts of shit. Jeffrey Epstein. Is he alive? Don't know. <laughs> if you wanna find out. You wanna find out. You know where yeah. to find us. I keep doing that. That's my new tick. Anywho, love ya. Bye. This week on After Hours. He's hot, but you don't have to come for other guys. Just show off your hot shit, dude. I don't have to come for other guys? I have to come for other oh, guys. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. I've, I've made an arrangement that I can't get out of, but you don't have to come for other What's guys. What's the arrangement? I can't talk about it. That's part of the arrangement. If he's six foot, uh, I'm, I'm, fucking... making a, I'm, I'm making a he's promise. He's six feet tall! Bring in the sword. I'm going to fall on it. He's six feet tall. He's 165 pounds. No, bring in the sword. I'm going to kill myself. Yeah, but can you imagine having to put sunblock on that body? <laughs> I, I'm imagining it right now. <laughs> What'd you say, Albert? No, I, I could do it. No, I'll get your front too. He uses vintage condoms, I think. Lambskin. I only use vintage pleated condoms. <laughs> you could brush that hair. <laughs> if it'll let me. Sign up on tmgstudios.tv to watch the full bonus episode.